when I think of Canada, Kamloops, like we're, we're a nation of good citizens. Like this is important to us as a value. And maybe it's sliding away from time to time. Like mm -hmm. we, we maybe lose connection with that. You're watching or listening to the crisis storm. Many would say that there is a crisis on our streets. Homelessness, addictions, and social impacts affect business, community, and individuals every day. Crisis Storm is a longer format episodic video series and audio podcast series that digs into the root causes of our street and social displacements through conversations with thought leaders, responders, and solution finders in the hope that we can inform and engage better conversations around these crises that are dividing and polarizing our community. Welcome to another episode of The Crisis Storm. We are on episode 11, and today I am joined by two incredible people uh, who I will introduce in a moment. And we're talking about the hidden, all too often hidden crisis of child abuse in our communities. Tara and Shelley, um, let's start with introducing you and the organizations that you're part of. Tara, tell us a little bit about yourself and the organization. Yeah, uh, so I'm Tara Attinger, the Executive Director of Big Bear Child and Youth Advocacy Center. Um, but also, yeah, a little deeper for me, the passion goes to um, my spearheaded the development of Big Bear about eight years ago. And so it's been in our community now operational for almost four years. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's uh, what Big Bear does is we coordinate child abuse investigations and just help, help prioritize um, children and youth um, their well-being during the process, during investigations, and and offer a place instead of you know going to the RCMP detachment or courthouse, offering a real child-friendly, trauma-informed place where um, you know where it, you know if they have to talk to police, um, being able to do it in a in a real comfortable environment, where again support is uh, is the priority, and just really understanding the needs of children, youth, and their families that are going through this. And uh, so, yeah, it's a yeah, huge passion of mine, but uh, just a, an amazing service to be a part of. Awesome. Yeah. And Shelly, tell us a little bit about yourself and mm -hmm. um, where you work. Yeah, so my name is Shelly Dean, and I am the director at the Center for Response-Based Practice, which I started at around the same time. Yeah about eight years ago as Tara was um, conceptualizing and bringing together a group of people um, to start Big Bear, I was doing the same thing to start the Center for Response-Based Practice, which is a counseling organization in downtown Cam Kamloops. We work with children and families around a wide variety of issues and we're also a specialized service uh, working around um, issues of violence. Uh, with children and adults where violence is at issue. So we're working with victims and perpetrators um, doing risk assessments and intervention services. And prior to that, uh, Tara and I have been colleagues working in this community for a very long time, I won't say how long, um, in the nonprofit sector. And, uh, and both come from a nonprofit background, um, working with children and families. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for the work that both of you do. Um, I, the, the elephant in the room. Uh, I think maybe some of our audience might be surprised that we're doing an episode on child abuse. Mm -hmm. um, but what I know is that I was guilty of um, assuming this is not a big thing. This is a rarity, a, an unfortunate rarity but I was corrected on that when we started working together several years ago. Right. Um, 
So the question, um, is child abuse a, a crisis in our community? Mm -hmm. Is this really a big thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, unfortunately the national stats for uh, children and youth being impacted by child abuse is one in three. And so if we look at, you know, the population of Kamloops for children and youth, um, the last stat I could find was 2016 stats. So roughly about 19,000 kids. So if you do the math, that's hundreds of kids being Im impacted by child abuse, right? Like over, over uh, yeah, I mean, that's hundreds of kids, right? And so, um, you know, we know that a lot of times it goes unreported. And so again, those numbers are, it's, it's really hard to get a definite number of, the, of what that impact looked like um, because there's just so many dynamics for a child to be able to disclose what's happening to them. Um, and, uh, and then again, getting this to the place where it can be investigated. And so those numbers are hard, but we know a solid number is one in three. Um, and so absolutely, you know, we're looking at Big Bear uh, working with a few hundred kids a year. And so when you think about um, the crises this is for a family um, going through this, it turns their world upside down, right? And so absolutely, and it's, it's I've heard different professionals say it's, it's, it is like that silent crisis because these people are really needing to heal and they're really in trauma and they're really in shock and they're trying to deal with the unimaginable. So they're not out there screaming and saying, help me, help me. And, and a lot of times this is internalized, abuse is internalized, right? And so it's, um, it is one of those silent crises where, you know, we're thinking there's hundreds of families that are being impacted by this a year, but we can also expand on that by looking at what is the impact factor of every child that's hurt and then those family members that are impacted by this and those children maybe sharing with their friends and other kids getting information that, whoa, this is, this is, this is big stuff, right? How do I process that? So when it's not just the number of we're working with several hundred kids a year, it's there's a big impact when you start really expanding that circle of who all this is impacting and who all this crisis is, um, yeah, has an impact for, right? So, uh, just for the benefit of our audience, what, how, how, how do we define yeah. child abuse? I was going to say, I think we also have to talk about what we're defining as yeah. abuse. Yeah. And, uh, and what we always say is, uh, when we would say um, that we're, we're talking about violence against children. And when we say violence, that's broadly defined. So we're talking about physical and emotional and psychological and sexualized. And, um, and the offender or the perpetrator of violence um, would be one or more people. But now we're also looking at uh, other, other, other forms. So when we think about the average age of children who are um, having pornography filtered into their lives uh, at, the, the, at the age of 10. The average age in Canada is 10 years old. Uh, we have to now start thinking about pornography as a sexualized offense against children uh, because they have no way of preventing that from happening. And so this is changing the way that we are, need to be responding to, uh, to what's happening to the children in our communities mm -hmm. and what, how, how, how they're being impacted by these things and how we're defining things like abuse. Right. Of course, the, the, the most important thing is to protect the child. It is. But I, I wonder, do we have a situation where this is staying under the radar? This people keep quiet about these things because of the stigma attached 
two families that um, are discovered as having child abuse within them? That's not an easy thing to answer. <laughs> I think one of the one of the things that I've learned over the years is, um, and research shows that too, that you know, being being a human, this is not something we naturally want to accept that this happens. And so, you know, um, so when we you know when we do hear about child abuse or suspect child abuse or we're you know. Um, these are really hard topics to talk about and it, and it does show that it's you know most people have a hard time talking about this have a hard time accepting this right and so I think it comes down to um, these are hard things to report because if our brains are saying no that couldn't have happened and we naturally just don't want to go there and imagine that a child is being hurt in such a way um, it is natural for our brains to just question and try and justify like what am I hearing and so it comes down to it you know reporting becomes a challenge that way because because of that right because your mind is always saying no that couldn't have happened no I didn't hear that right um, and so and you know. what if the offender is somebody you love and trust mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah this is going to rip your family apart absolutely and what if reporting I mean I think that depends where you're located in society doesn't it what if reporting um, is a risk to you and your only history with Absolutely. the police is has been dangerous. If you're an Indigenous person in Canada, um, only 20, the, the stats show only 27% of Indigenous people in Canada are likely to go to the police when, they are, when they're afraid or when a crime has occurred. Yeah. And so I think that's a difficult question because mm -hmm. I, th I would say that depends. That's a, those are very good points. Um, so when we look at um, wanting, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that everybody that watching wants to help protect children. How do we know? How do we, how do we see what are the signs of a child being abused so that we don't run off and make assumptions that maybe be damaging? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I, and I think that's not an easy question to answer as well because I um, absolutely there you know there's lots of resources to help people understand that uh, you know is my child struggling or is this child struggling um, you know a lot of resources say you know if there's sudden changes or um, in their moods or they're uh, you know um, you know at school and so forth but I always say take that with caution too because we don't want to jump the gun and just assume oh my goodness like there's been a big change in my child's behavior there must be something happening and so I just it really comes down to communication and connection and having these dialogues and so you know whether they're having them at school or whether they're having you know in families it's just it really is about keeping those connections open keeping those communications open and then also you know consult Right, there's so many resources mm -hmm. in Kamloops that you know Big Bears open um, ourselves up to anyone can call us and consult about that. But you know, even with child protection and RCMP, they're always there. They're just like, you know what, call. It doesn't have to be an official report. If you're not sure, just pick up just pick up a phone and, and consult yeah. and, and talk about it. That's the best thing we can do, right? So it's really it's about keeping those communications with our kids open and always having dialogue and checking in and making that a habit every day. But then if you're feeling those gut feelings, just don't leave those, right? Consult and reach out. We have so many people in our community that we could reach out to. Yeah, yeah and I think uh, a big one is to err on the side of believing kids. Mm. When they are speaking up and they speak up in in a way that is consistent with their developmental stage. And so they, it might be through their play or through language or uh, to friends or in a variety of ways. Um, but in whatever way they might be speaking up, err on the side of believing them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely.
if um, child abuse is left unaddressed, where does that lead? Like, what do we know about uh, unaddressed um, victims of child abuse? Yeah, um, quite a bit. And um, in fact, what the research is really clear about is that uh, there's much stronger evidence that the way that children or any victim of abuse or violence is responded to has more to do with how well they will be um, than the abuse itself. And so when a child experiences uh, abuse in broadly defined, um, it, the importance of being believed, of receiving help, of uh, having a positive social response in one way or another is essential. When that doesn't happen, uh, when they're blamed, when they're not believed, when they're not helped, uh, that is when the likelihood of them receiving a mental health diagnosis down the road, uh, getting into trouble with the law, having trouble in school, these kinds of things, it, the, the likelihood of that is risen exponentially. And there's clear evidence of that. There's lots of research around it. Yeah. You said that you, you work with the perpetrators as well as yes. the victims. Yes. What does that look like? Um, well, it looks a lot of different ways. We do risk assessments as a way of uh, trying to understand uh, how to create safety. Uh, or increase safety mm -hmm. in families. And um, we also do intervention. So w once we understand where the risk level is, to engage people further in, in, in increasing safety in an ongoing kind of way. And uh, we're doing that all the time. So it's in our minds it's not adequate to uh, be a service just working for victims of violence we're not going to really get anywhere there mm -hmm. we need to be providing services for people who are using violence against others uh, yeah prevention but also uh, you know another way to look at that too is you know we work with a lot of families where um, you know, it is a family member that is the alleged or was the one that was hurting the child. Um, but a lot of times, you know, they need to be reintegrated. They're reintegrated back into the family. And yeah. so how do you do that in a real healthy way, right? And so those services mm -hmm. are so important on that aspect as well because you need that, you need that healing for both ways, for the, for the child, for the, for the adult that was possibly doing the hurting, right? And so and when done important. well, and, and uh, we're able to have the right kind of conversations, what we find over and over is that people are taking responsibility. They don't want to be hurting mm -hmm. their children. Uh, they're honest about what they've done. Um, and, they're, and their children are able to speak to what has happened. Uh, and that's when you're able to create really, um, I think, adequate enough safety plans. And what we always say is, uh, well, victims already know a lot about creating safety. They've been doing it for a long time. But the way to create safety is the person who's causing the harm. That's the person who will create safety. And so that's who creates the safety plan. What are you willing to do? Mm -hmm. to create safety for your family. And that's who comes up with the safety plan. Wow, mm -hmm. okay. That's interesting. Do you find that um, the person instigating the violence, causing the harm, is often 
someone that hasn't been able to deal with uh, being a victim themselves? Often. It's common. Is that a sign of the times that we live in or is it just coming to light more now? I mean, is it, is it, is it the, all of these crises in community, the, the issue of finances, all of these stresses, the pressures, are they um, causing more violence against children? I'd never want to say they're a cause. Okay. I think there, there's correlations. Um, there's a lot of pressure on people. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on you. There's a lot of pressure on me. There's a lot of pressure on everybody. Which is why I would not want to say it's a cause. Because if, if that were true, then uh, there would be a real risk that you're going to become violent within your family. There's a decision that gets made that because of um, these pressures, uh, there's uh, permission to hurt other people. And that's just not true. That, like, it's not true that that causes this. But yes, I think there's a correlation. Are you, are you finding at all that, that um, um, the perpetrators are lacking coping mechanisms themselves, communication skills themselves, um, things of that nature? No. No? I mean, I, I, I wouldn't say across the board that that's true either. Mm. Are we doing enough in schools? We work, yeah, system. we work really closely with with the school, um, with Big Bear, and 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 I think you know that really does become key. I think you know the school has they have great responses to children's needs, and and uh, yeah, they're I think they do a phenomenal job. And I think one of the things that again learning over the years is it really is about working together and the collaboration. Right, because it's like, you know, we know a small piece of what's going on for these children and the families and their lives. The school knows another piece, and maybe the RCMP knows another piece, and child protection and other agencies. And so, you know, uh, a lot of the key to a CYC success is that collaboration of, um, of service, right, of, of working together and really mm -hmm. um, having that wraparound approach to, to each situation. And so, um, so I think, you know, the schools are doing a really good job, but I, yeah, I, I think, you know, the key is, is really about the collaboration and working together and, and um, making sure that every aspect of, you know, what this child is needing is, is, is you know, enhanced. Um, you know, for a child to heal um, from the impacts of violence, you know, the more protective factors they can have in their life, um, mm -hmm. the better the outcomes, right? And so success in school, connecting with peers, relationships, um, and, and just going on and on. And so, mm -hmm. so I think that's, that really is a key, is, is working together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any further thoughts about the... Yeah. System? Uh, oh. Um, yeah. I. Th I think. I'm. I'm not as involved as Tara is in what's currently happening in the school systems. Um, but I think the more that can be happening, the better, uh, because I think that um, the the education system is such a great place to be talking about about all of this and that's that's where kids are and that's where families are a lot of the time the parents as well and that's where they spend the majority of their they do hours right they it's do at school so yeah uh, and it's in a, in a sense it's a it's the hub of a community and 
Um, so it's just the logical place to uh, have lots of conversations, and I think lots of conversations are happening there. Um, so the more of this kind of information, it, yeah, that can, and I know that there's, it's hard sometimes to have conversations uh, approved even, like when I'm talking about pornography and bringing in this kind of curriculum, it's not that easy. Um, and I think it's essential. I think it's about the protection of children. It's not the mandate of anybody else to be uh, protecting children in this way. It's not the mandate of the Ministry for Children and Families to see that as a child protection issue. It's so unless it is created as the mandate of somebody, we're not we're going to miss it. Mm -hmm. mm. So you see that really as part of the mandate of the school system? Well, I don't, I, it's not that I see it that way, but I think it's important that it becomes the mandate mm -hmm. of somebody. It's that serious and it's that pervasive. There's no parental control that kids can't get past if they want to. And they do want to because they're kids. And that's as old as time. The difference is it's not um, erotica anymore. It's not uh, just naked bodies anymore. It's, it's violence uh, and it's serious. Mm -hmm. So what they're looking at has changed. Mm. Okay, time for a quick break. Sure. We're gonna grab some water, we're gonna breathe. Uh, and we're going to be right back with more from Tara and from Shelley uh, right after these messages from our sponsors. In Kamloops, we're not just lawyers, we're forward law. We're about moving you forward. Approachable, caring, and experienced. That's who we are. From contract writing to estate planning, civil litigation to employment law, whatever your need, we've got your back. We push for fair resolutions. We're not afraid to take on the tough cases. Forward thinking estate planning, strong advocacy, and unwavering support. Forward Law, your partner in progress. Call us today, because your future deserves nothing less. Welcome to the heart of business in Kamloops, Southgate Business Center your one-stop destination for all your office needs. Conveniently located at 970 Lavelle Crescent, Southgate Business Center offers more than just office space. Whether you're a startup, a freelancer, or a well-established business, we've got you covered. Need a professional office space? Our offices provide the ideal environment for productivity and success. Planning a meeting or presentation? Elevate your business with our conference room available for rent. At Southgate Business Centre, we understand the importance of efficiency. Our secretarial services ensure you have the support you need so you can focus on what matters most, growing your business. For office rentals, conference rooms, secretarial services and more, contact Southgate Business Centre at 250-374-9233 or visit us at 970 Lavelle Crescent in Kamloops. Southgate Business Centre, your destination for success in the heart of Kamloops. Call us today and experience a new level of business excellence. We are back uh, with Tara and uh, and Shelley talking about child abuse, and we're gonna we're gonna turn the tables a little bit here um, on um, Big Bear Child and Youth Advocacy Center. Help us understand what what was the process for a child for a family. Um, in reporting child abuse prior to there being the center actually running here in Kamloops, Big Bear Child and Youth Advocacy Center. Tell us what that process was like before Big Bear and how it's changed now that Big Bear uh, is running here in Kamloops. Right, yeah. So essentially, you know, when... Um 
when a child, you know, indicates that um, that they're they've been impacted by trauma or abuse in some way, then that you know it you know hopefully that turns into a report with child protection or RCMP, and so um, and so it's you know mandated in Canada for obviously child protection and RCMP to look into that and investigate that, um, and so. What that includes is usually the first um, first part of the investigations is talking with a child um, to better understand what happened, what occurred, and so they can put all the pieces together and and um, you know and that's what basically creates an investigated case. And so before Big Bear, um, children were brought down to the RCMP detachment. Um, to have that conversation, which is called a forensic interview with a, um, a police officer. Um, sometimes uh, we do have child protection doing those interviews as well. And so basically, when you think about Big Bear, it's, it's you know, the biggest thing is, is taking them out of those environments. And so, you know, those conversations, those forensic interviews are now happening at Big Bear. And so, um, you know, the decor of Big Bear, you've been there, it's really warm and welcoming and, and um, just right away we want to create a space where, you know, children and families are feeling more comfortable and less that this is, um, yeah, this is a scary process, right? And so, um, yeah, and so again, we prioritize really how are these kids and families doing when they're coming into Big Bear. and and uh, slowing things down a little bit, right? And, and ensuring that when the police come to Big Bear, they're not in their uniforms and we call everyone by their first names and, and just, you know, if they're hungry or thirsty and it just accommodate whatever they're needing and go at a pace that works for them. Um, you know, we've had some kids that just really just need to be help with some mindfulness and, and grounding before the interview and sometimes that has taken over an hour. And, and that's what's so nice is we're not in a rush pace. It's, you know, what are they needing at this time? Um, and then again, the big thing is, is that collaboration with so many agencies involved to really understand kind of the whole picture of the child and the family, their culture, um, communication styles, and just so we can really create a process to just create an opportunity for for that child to say what they need to say um, and just have the best opportunity to be able to do that. And so um, so just learning so much about both the child and the family and putting all these things together so we can have a real, um, yeah, a, a holistic approach as far as really understanding their needs. Um, you know, and then, uh, you know, another huge aspect of Big Bear is, is uh, research. There is research out there to show that a lot of times children and families are not getting connected to um, the healing support services that they're needing after to recover from this trauma or the impacts of the trauma. And so a big part of the CYC's Big Bear is having these long-term follow-ups with, with our families and our children to basically we kind of go by the motto of how are you doing and what do you need? And just helping with, are you connected to the services that you're needing right now? Do you have enough supports? Um, you know, and it's really important that it's long-term because a way a child may internalize um, being impacted by abuse when they're seven can really change when they're 10. And so it's so important to have that long-term follow-up mm -hmm. and really understanding um, helping them also understand, um, you know, what is it that that your healing needs are and that's specifically for you. And like Shelley was saying when we were on break, you know, sometimes it isn't counseling, right? And so sometimes it's a connection to a group or sometimes it's, a, you know, a deeper connection with their culture. Or, or an animal. Or an animal we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how mm -hmm. research is just showing that phenomenally, mm -hmm. how animals are so therapeutic, right? And so we have to look at healing needs so individualistic and not stereotype that because this happened, 
this is this is this is where we're going to go and so we don't have an answer no no absolutely. there's no one answer absolutely and I think that's what makes Kamloops also so wonderful is we just have so many services that it really is mm -hmm. utilizing you know um, knowing what's out there and and helping families and kids connect to the to these services right so they have the best opportunity um, to really heal from the impacts of, of this trauma. Mm. I know that some people, when we look at the crisis, for example, of homelessness, we've been dealing with this for decades. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's often thought that, well, if we could just do X, whatever X is, if we could just, you know, set up 200 more housing units there's 200 homeless people, 200 housing units. We got it solved. That'll fix everything. Um, and sometimes we put those solutions in place and we see a difference. And sometimes we don't see a difference. Four years ago, we didn't have Big Bear. We didn't have... We had the concept that you were working on, but not the application of that concept. Have you seen a huge difference, a change? Um, is it making an impact mm -hmm. now with having the process in place? Tell me about that. Yeah, I think, you know, the larger systemic issues, I mean, those those take a lot of time, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, the the overall hope of having you know, when you have a CYC in your community is that it brings more awareness, it brings more opportunity for children and youth to say, you know what, yeah, I need to share what's happened with me. Um, maybe make it easier for community members to report or consult or just work in partnership as far as what that's going to look like. So the bigger factor, that's, that takes time to really um, understand the impacts in a community um at an individual level absolutely it's um yeah i get the privilege to see really how this changed has changed the trajectory for some children's lives and families lives as far as having that support right at the onset of when a when it's first known when a child has been impacted by abuse um watching them go through this um kind of state of shock, shock and turmoil in the very beginning um, and then, you know, I mean, unfortunately, investigations can last for a few years. Um, and so watching families go through that. Um, but I guess the magic of it all is being able to um, witness how with that support and the connections to community services and just everyone working together, absolutely, we have seen some really incredible um, families heal and situations change for for kids it's telling that you say we see some incredible families heal um, you know it the tendency I think from a human standpoint is to think of them as broken families mm -hmm. not incredible families um, it's just an interesting choice of words. Well, and I think, you know, the vision absolutely at Big Bear, it's uh, really honoring, there's a lot of strength in these kids coming to Big Bear, right? And there's a lot of, yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, look at them with incredible strength and admiration because they are making the choice at the end of the day to come to Big Bear and share what had happened to them. And that takes a lot of bravery and that takes a lot of uh, courage. And so absolutely every, every child that comes through that door is gonna know, is gonna know that. We're gonna really, you know, let them know like how proud we are of them because this really did take a lot of courage and bravery and we're just so proud of them. So absolutely every family and every child that comes through that door are pretty incredible people. Hmm. Tell me more about the connection between um, Big Bear Child and Youth Advocacy Center, 
and the Center for Response-Based Practice. Yeah, uh, sure. I, I want to say, I, as far as the difference of having Big Bear in the community, mm -hmm. um, one other thing, if I'm not mistaken, that when a family goes to Big Bear, they're the only f family in the center. Yeah. And that's unheard of. Like that's so unusual because in any other resource you enter and become part of a very fast paced environment, which is the exact opposite of what is needed when you're in distress. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, Big Bear is the only place that I'm aware of that where you will enter and be the only family in that resource mm -hmm. and that among other things like that Tara's just mentioned like professionals being called by their first name police in plain clothes um, they, they even even the staff and the police come through a completely backdoor entrance mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. through the same entrance as the family yeah. right yeah all things that just really um, indicate a high level of respect. Um, that uh, has created such respect from pro professionals who are referring and trust in the resource. And so I think that it, it is a very important uh, piece of information to mm. mention Thanks. compared to the alternative. And mm. the alternative was always with trepidation, like it is the law in Canada to <laughs> report to the M RCMP and MCFD and that can go very well. And sometimes it doesn't. Mm. And you felt a responsibility to say both things, but that's not required anymore. And that's very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. yeah, and so as far as our connection, um, yeah, there's a real courage to come forth and make this report. And um, also I, I would say that when something like this happens in the life of a child and a family, um, I think most of us would hope to have the kind of, um, uh, I don't know, bravery and um, just intelligence mm -hmm. <laughs> that children show mm -hmm. w when they're in this, the distress of being harmed in these kinds of ways. And so it's not hard to be in awe of the kinds of things that Tara is talking about, the kinds of things that you get to hear and I get to hear in, in the course of doing this work. And so I think this is a big part of our connection over the years is, yeah, just the incredible mm -hmm. stories um, of that come from children and families. And, so they come forward to do this and then we've had conversations about what's next and we provide service um, to children and families about that piece and what's next for them. And sometimes they want to um, get a puppy mm. <laughs> or horseback riding lessons or um, something else in nature or and sometimes they want family counseling or the child wants to meet with somebody alone or and then Tara might or they might come to us or a different kind of counseling service but that's mm -hmm. where we connect and Tara and I have talked about mm -hmm. um, a dream of creating a specialized service just for children mm -hmm. 
uh, that is a partnership between Big Bear and the Centre for Response-Based Practice. Mm -hmm. And so this is a dream that we hold. What, what, what would that specialized service look like over and above what you already do in your practices? Yeah, well, what we already do is multi service like we 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 work with adults and children and um and of all ages and for a wide range of issues and we have a a room that is dedicated just for children um in a building that where lots of people are coming and um so this idea of what about just having a separate space that is really designated for children and designed for children, mm -hmm. um, where it's just about them. And immediate, and I think, you know, yeah. um, you know, the biggest, you know, I can kind of wrap up our connection in one word is just trauma and just really our goal to really try and decrease the impact of this trauma that children and families are going through. And, and so when Shelly and I, continue to have conversations about you know what children and youth are needing when they've experienced this kind of trauma is immediate right and so um, not always is that available um, at, right at the onset and so um, the vision is you know helping uh, kids especially through those deep emotions that um, come with experiencing trauma, right? And, and you know, um, the worry is that it's very common for uh, kids to, to feel, you know, blame or shame or embarrassment. And it's just like, if we can mitigate that, if we can help a child not feel like that tomorrow, um, that's the goal, right? Of, of not having kids you know, spend another day feeling that way about something that they in no way um, are a part of. This is something that had happened to them, right? And so again, there yeah. is that immediacy for for kids to have that opportunity to- And not having them sit on wait lists. And not sit on wait lists. Like this is the urgent crises is, why should a child spend a day feeling embarrassed, ashamed, blaming themselves. Or being blamed. Or being blamed. And so working also yeah. with families of those children um, around some of those issues so that yeah. the families can be as supportive as possible. No, they're often wondering, what do we say? What should we do? How can we be as supportive as possible? And sometimes the blame is they're inadvertently blaming or they, Sometimes I guess it's intentional, but I think lots of times it isn't. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, I think the whole family needs support and Absolutely. not just the child. And so we do take a family approach always when we're working with children. Um, so when we're talking about designing a space for children, um, that's not at all with the idea of excluding family. Mm -hmm. We always take a family approach. But I do think that children need a space where it's designed for them and they feel comfortable. Way too often we're bringing children into adult designed spaces mm -hmm. and thinking that this is gonna be good for them. Mm -hmm. And it isn't. They don't feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. That's not where they're likely to wanna talk. Mm -hmm. um, they're all, yeah, they're just not. And so just to be clear, the the idea of creating this space that's designed to make children feel a lot more at ease mm -hmm. and less stress you're talking about that from the post report therapeutical yes. stage because we already now have that that's right with the report um and discovery stage yes okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um that's fantastic yeah, and, and and to touch on what Shelley's talked about, the the real importance too of of um, focusing on the whole family, right? Because absolutely, it's it's uh, you know the child has all these emotions trying to deal with you know the the impact of this trauma, but we also have to remember these caregivers 
are in shock too a lot of times and so now they're trying to parent a child that they you know that the child's in trauma and the parents in trauma and so it is so important to uh, support the whole family that's supporting the family right I mean the well-being of that parent is is really impacting that child as well so yeah so you do need to look at it holistically and and involve the whole yeah. family right? they're all responding to what's happened and this whatever form of violence has occurred but they're all going to be responding to it in a different mm -hmm. kind of way right. um, and and that's yeah it's difficult for everybody mm -hmm. and so nobody can be left out the other piece I want to add to too I think we have a good connection about that is we really need to take care of the people that do this work yeah and so you know that's a real commonality between yeah response-based and Big Bear is that we really have to not only look after the staff of Big Bear but remembering that you know the RCMP that are coming in the child protection people that are coming in these are you know the people who are working in non they're dealing the first responders the absolutely. list goes on absolutely and so you know Big Bear is embedded in that response mm -hmm. base is embedded of that that we just we need to take care of that right and uh, what does that care look like I, I know that you've in, implemented yeah. some strategies at Big Bear. Can you tell us a little bit about what does that uh, attention to care for the caregivers, right. um, for those frontline workers, right. what does that look like? Well, I, you know, we have to look at, you know, so the impacts of trauma, just not on the child and the family, but the impact of hearing trauma over and over and over again from these first responders. And so the thing about trauma is how we interpret what we hear or how we feel about what we hear mm. has everything to do with what we've experienced, what we've learned, um, who we are. And so we don't know what story is gonna impact, how it's gonna have an impact or, or what story is gonna have an impact. And so it's not like you can just be ready that oh this was a a difficult story and I'm you know I'm going to be impacted and and so it really you know it it it's one of those things that can really sneak up on first responders or people that are doing this right and I think what especially with first responders they're trained to respond to crises and so a lot of times there's that lack of awareness for how impacted you were by what you just heard that sometimes that just goes buried and it's so easy for that secondary trauma or vicarious trauma right to, to just kind of sneak it sneak up on you and, and not even realize it because you're just so busy responding to the crises at hand that there isn't necessarily the time to reflect and go, how was I just impacted by what I just heard, by what I just witnessed? And so when you think these first responders, this is daily, numerous times a day. And so the chances of them being impacted by what they've witnessed or what they heard is very probable, it is very high that that's going to happen. And so, you know, especially um, times are busy and a lot of places are short-staffed and mm -hmm. so um so i guess you know a, another crisis is is uh how do we address that that mm -hmm. um are we taking care of ourselves and so i think that's just you know as shelly and i talk it's just like i think we can go on and on and on about that right as far as things that we can implement and things that we can do better and how can we take care of each other um, who do this very important work of mm. of of this right and so um, so that's yeah another connection so yeah like I've heard such interesting uh, stories from various first responders of um, where they just had a practice of just a really great unit or something and a really great um, I won't say who because, uh, anyway, leader, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. where 
they just were debriefing all throughout the shift. They just had that way and that connection and they were debriefing all throughout the shift. And the leader um, was kind of also a friend and checked in at the end of the shift and invited them all to the, his house uh, mm -hmm. really regularly. And they sat around and they, they just like weren't talking about work, but they were really um, just hanging out. But then they also would talk about work when they needed to. And the description from that person was that they were feeling really good, even in these times, really good, really healthy, really grounded. So again, I, you know, when you look at the, the responses, the social responses that people are receiving and how well or unwell they feel, it's so connected. And when those are taken away or absent, it has a direct impact on um, again, how well or unwell the mental health diagnosis that might be connected, whether or not somebody's feeling like they might be struggling with depression, anxiety, addiction, some other, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. um, or just, un yeah, unhappy or traumatized by what it is they're experiencing. Mm. And so I think, you know, I think when I think of Canada, Kamloops, like we're, we're a nation of good citizens. Like this is important to us as a value. And maybe it's sliding away from time to time. Like we, we maybe lose connection with that. But I think it's in us. Like this is in us and who we are. And so when I think of that story and this crew who are staying connected, like we cannot lose touch or we'll lose ourselves here. This is too hard. And this leader who's making sure to like hang on to this crew. Mm -hmm. I just think, yeah, that's right. That's yeah. where it's at. That's what we need to do. And we need to do it in a bigger way. Mm. Yeah. Because if we don't, we're going to lose the plot here. Which is, I think, what mm -hmm. you're describing. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we do that? But it doesn't take a special qualification mm -hmm. in mental health. It's just connection. Yeah. yeah connection. Absolutely. We're going to talk more about that with some wrap-up words right after one more break uh, to recognize our sponsors. We'll be right back with the Crisis Storm. In Kamloops, we're not just lawyers, we're forward long. We're about moving you forward. Approachable, caring, and experienced. That's who we are. From contract writing to estate planning, civil litigation to employment law, whatever your need, we've got your back. We push for fair resolutions. We're not afraid to take on the tough cases. Forward thinking estate planning, strong advocacy, and unwavering support. Forward Law, your partner in progress. Call us today, because your future deserves nothing less. Welcome to the heart of business in Kamloops, Southgate Business Centre, your one-stop destination for all your office needs. Conveniently located at 970 Lavelle Crescent, Southgate Business Centre offers more than just office space. Whether you're a startup, a freelancer, or a well-established business, we've got you covered. Need a professional office space? Our offices provide the ideal environment for productivity and success. Planning a meeting or presentation? Elevate your business with our conference room available for rent. At Southgate Business Centre, we understand the importance of efficiency. Our secretarial services ensure you have the support you need so you can focus on what matters most, growing your business. For office rentals, conference rooms, secretarial services, and more, contact Southgate Business Centre at 250-374-9233 or visit us at 970 Laval Crescent in Kamloops. Southgate Business Centre, your destination for success in the heart of Kamloops. Call us today and experience a new level of business excellence. Okay, so we're back 
uh, for wrapping up our session here with Tara and Shelley uh, from Big Bear and the Center for Response-Based Practice about the impacts on children in our community from the crisis of child abuse. Um, I think probably one of the, the best ways to kind of wrap this up is to talk about what's next from a future perspective for Big Bear and, and uh, the Center for Response-Based Practice. What do you see is really needed um, in order to move forward in a good and healthy and productive way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think for us, our hope is to develop a separate resource that is specific to meet the needs of children who have been to Big Bear, have made a disclosure, or or maybe they've just decided not to disclose, but they are victims of violence and require a specific resource. Um, and that's the decision that they've made to access professional services. We want a resource that is designed for children and their families um, that is uh, somewhat apart from the other services that we offer. So for us, that's, that's the next step um, and that's the immediate goal to find a way to create a resource like that. So that's sort of a longer term sort of therapeutic support uh, system. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's longer term, sometimes it goes really quickly. It really depends on what's needed for that family or that child. Now, sometimes it's surprisingly not long. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I would have assumed that it's always a long process. No, it is not always a long process. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. Um, final thoughts about um, misconceptions uh, or or perspectives that you really want to see changed in our community. I think just you know, um, hopefully between you know all the all the services and the conversation that we're having here, it just creating opportunities so we can talk about this more. Right, and so this, it doesn't become this silent crises, right? Because that isn't what children need. Right. Children need the opportunity to be able to talk about this. And if we're not comfortable talking about this, how the heck are we expecting our kids to be able to be comfortable to talk about this? Is this, do you, is, is, it, is it possible that um, we see a lot of child abuse and, and, and this, this type of crisis in our community because we don't talk about it enough? I think it adds to that definitely, right? It's, it's never been a subject that's been easy to talk about. Mm. It's never been highlighted as a topic that we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think, you know, there's more initiatives throughout Canada, throughout the world that are, that are helping to promote the awareness and the ability for people to talk about that. But I think, you know, um, if anything, that's, that's something that, yeah, would be a dream going forward is to be able to create a world where it's just like, these are, you know, we, whether it's connecting with resources to help us talk about it or um, helping families being able to talk about this at a family level um, whatever it be, may be, but it just, yeah, creating more opportunities so this is um, open dialogue and, and creating more opportunities for kids to feel comfortable to be able to talk about it, right? Mm -hmm. it's, I would say, I think it's the same for Tara. It's our experience that kids want to talk about this and given the opportunity uh, they will, and they absolutely have the right to tell the truth. And so to remove the barriers is that, and that's what we're trying to do, is remove the barriers that prevent them from talking and prevent them from their, their natural way of telling the truth about what's happening or has happened. And 
Uh, and that's up to adults. That's not them. That's up to adults. And so, yeah, it isn't easy. It isn't what anyone wants to be talking about. But um, it is in the best interest of kids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on the break, we were talking about uh, the conversations are happening anyways, whether you're part of it or not as a, as a parent or an adult. They so, are telling each other. Yeah. yeah. Like, let's be honest. <laughs> they are not, they are talking. They're just not talking to um, people who can create safety necessarily for them. Mm -hmm. But very often when we, when we get to ask them, if they've told anyone, they've told people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, more information. If if there's, uh, I mean, is there is there anything that you think that our audience should really know or understand? Is there a way that they can help? How can they find more information? Yeah, email is probably always our best, and then there's the uh, us being able to track that, you know, um, people are in, making inquiries and so forth. So email is always great. And uh, again, it's, you know, opening up the services to, you know, anytime people have questions or just want to talk about stuff, we're always available for that, right? And uh, and I think there's yeah. so many great services in our in our community where they feel the exact same thing, right? It's just like, and I think that's what's so magical about a good community is, is uh, you know, people can call agencies to just say, I have a question about this. And I think anyone would um, bend over backwards to give them the information that, you know, that people are, are needing or just wanting to consult about or collaborate about. And so just really reach out, reach out at any time that, you know, people are needing information and, Okay. Yeah, what's yeah. what's the email address for for Big Bear? That yeah, can so info at bigbearcyc.ca for us. Okay, we'll put that up on the screen. Yeah, and ours is admin at rbpinterior.com. Okay, fantastic. Any any further thoughts uh, from yourself, Shelley? With yeah, I agree to... with what Tara's saying. Is reach out if uh, try to have as many conversations with kids as possible from whatever vantage point you're at, um, and as open as possible, and uh, and and it and talk to people, find the services uh, if you're not sure what to say, because that's not uncommon. It's hard. Um, but there's lots of services that have really great information and can help with that. Um, can help with what, how to talk to kids about pornography, about violence, um, about bullying, about all of the topics that are a bit tricky with mm -hmm. how to bring them up. So, thank you both for everything mm -hmm. you do in our community uh, and for joining us here at the studio. And uh, Please reach out to Tara and to Shelley if you have any questions uh, or thoughts. Um, and also we'll put a link here in the description. Uh, if you'd like to take a tour of the Big Bear Child Youth Advocacy Center, uh, you can watch the video that we did last year. And we'll also include links to a documentary that we did with uh, Big Bear mm -hmm. Child uh, Youth Advocacy Center uh, called um can remember uh, yeah what is it um, <laughs> uh silence uh silos. silos silos yeah oh my goodness violence violence silence and silos yeah uh so you can check that out in the description link below uh this podcast video uh we'll see you next time on the crisis storm you're watching or listening to the crisis storm Many would say that there is a crisis on our streets in Kamloops and in cities across North America. Homelessness, addictions, and social impacts affect business, community, and individuals every day. Crisis Storm is a longer format episodic video series and audio podcast series that digs into the root causes of our street and social displacements through conversations with thought leaders, responders, and solution finders 
in the hope that we can inform and engage better conversations around these crises that are dividing and polarizing our community. All of us at the Crisis Storm Podcast would like to thank our sponsors for their support and care for the community of Kamloops and its residents. Southgate Business Center and Forward Law are two such sponsors that deserve your consideration. If you found value in this episode of Crisis Storm, please don't forget to give us a like and share with others. Thank you for joining the conversation and being part of the solution to the many crises that we face in our community. Crisis Storm is a production of Mastermind Studios in association with AIM Canada Mentorship Society. For more information on the Crisis Storm podcast series and the documentary film project titled Finding a Way Forward, please visit findingawayforward.com. Crisis Storm can be watched on YouTube along with listening to the audio versions on many podcast platforms including Spotify, Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Pocket Casts, and RSS. If you've got questions for the producers of the show or suggestions on topics and guests for future shows, please send them to info at mastermindstudios.ca.